talk this evening is on the naked mind. I know, very risque. So we're going to talk about taking all the, stripping all the crap off of your brain. What does that look like? And the naked mind is actually a concept that's pretty common in Mahayana, which is not a, Mahayana Buddhism, which is kind of a branch of Buddhism that's not us. But I think it's very much grounded in our tradition as well of Theravada. It's just not usually spoken of in those terms. But um, I don't think I'll get in too much trouble. I'm going to borrow some terms and terminology from Mahayana and actually from, from Tibetan kind of traditions and talk about it a bit. But let's start with just kind of what our brain does and how things can kind of glom onto it. And it makes it stiff and rigid. Sort of like, I, you know, down here, when I lived in North Carolina, I saw it all the time. I don't see as much here. Do you have kudzu? You know how it grows up around, it's like this vine, an invasive vine that will grow up around a tree and actually sop up all of the sun and everything else and eventually the tree underneath it dies. And we can have this sort of kudzu in our life of thoughts, beliefs, things that we hold on to rigidly that make it hard for our mind to breathe, to get light, to adapt. And if our minds are not able to adapt, then they freeze and in a sense they die. They die to the natural growth, the natural shifting of moment to moment. So what we're going to talk about is where do we get rigid? When is it appropriate to be firm in our thoughts? And when is it better to be more flexible? Where do we draw that line that, okay, I'm not going to cross that, versus being open-minded? And how do we get to a point of having our minds more naked, less encumbered by that kudzu growing over it, less encrusted with crap? Um, this is something that the Buddha actually talked about a lot, the problem of having a rigid mind, of knowing all the answers, rather than being open to the truth of this moment. It's something we see every day. So, uh, I don't know if you've noticed it, every once in a while it seems like in the public forums people will talk about religion in very rigid ways. Has anybody ever noticed this? Like, my religion is right and yours is wrong? I mean, I've even heard people talk about places like hell and heaven. I mean, rigidity. Politics. Anybody ever seen any rigidity around politics these days? You know, I was looking up, remember that, um, what they call dress gate? That dress that was on the internet, and some people thought it was white and yellow, and other people thought it was... Blue and black. You know, that was like 2008. I mean, it was like a while back. I'm feeling very old with this. You know, we're the white and yellow side versus black and blue side. And people were getting in arguments and just their minds blown. Rigidity. I know what color it is. Can't convince me I don't know what color it is. So, the naked mind. I think when we talk about the mind, we start with one of the three basic truths within Buddhism, which is called anatta, or not self, is the typical translation. I think of it as there's no essential being to anything. Okay, there is no essence. What do we mean by that? It means that I want to think of myself as Roy, and Roy has always existed, and Roy will exist until I die, and that there is a Royness to me. And that that is distinct and will always be. 
The reality is, if I look at a picture of myself from when I was a kid, I don't look anything like I did now. And in fact, there isn't a cell in my body that was there when I was a child. There isn't a neuron firing that the neuron was there when I was a kid. There is no fixed Roy. That doesn't mean Roy doesn't exist, but Roy is fixed and permanent and unchanging. It doesn't exist. And it's true for everything. It's true of this building. It's true of the sky. It's true of the earth. There was a time when the earth did not exist, and there will be a time when the sun will expand and will either swallow up or burn off the earth. But nothing is permanent. Basic truth that we don't really like to think about a lot, but is unavoidable when we really think about it. So <clears throat> we have to start from this place of this radical acceptance of change. So whatever I think, whatever I believe, maybe not always so. It's the ancient Zen answer, not always so. So. You know, are the conservatives right? Are the liberals right? Not always so. Is this the way to go? Not always. Can we start from that place of just letting go a little bit that need to have an answer that's always going to work? Because in my experience, there is no one answer that always works in every situation. So when we talk about empty mind or naked mind. Well, when we talk about naked mind, we talk about empty mind. Not as in like, duh, you know, I, I have no thoughts, right? But as in clarity, as in letting go of that stuff that encumbers our thoughts and really starting from this moment and from ground zero. Can I go into this conversation, can I go into this moment without a preconceived notion of what's going to happen? Easy concept to understand, very difficult practice to experience. And we'll talk in a moment about why it is that evolution and the way our brains work doesn't, don't want us to do that. But it starts with being in this moment and open to it. So our tendency is to take the past and say, okay, I've learned from the past, I'm going to apply those rules to the future, and if I do everything based on what I've learned, then the future will be better. And sometimes that works, but we do it too much. We rely on it too much. Can This practice is, can I go into this moment completely open to whatever this moment is, without preconceptions? As Kenpo Gangshar says, don't pursue the past and don't invite the future. Simply rest naturally in the naked, ordinary mind of the immediate present without trying to correct it or replace it. We're just open to whatever this moment is, positive, negative, whatever judgments we want to put on it. We can just drop those for a moment and just be open. This is this moment. It may be a moment of pain, it may be a moment of pleasure, but it is this moment and we embrace it as what it is. So that's just, that's naked mind. That's just being present to the moment without preconceptions, without demanding anything of it, open, free, clear. Mindful. So where do we get stuck? Why don't we do that all the time? Well, we've got a lot going against us. Evolution for one. But I can think of it like, so I'm a little bit scrambled tonight, I will admit that. And part of it was I was a little, got here a little later than I'd wanted to, and I have a lot going on. But one of the things I have going on is my HVAC unit at home has died. 
and it's not that old, but this is the south, and it's humid, and stuff gets on it. And so the uh, HVAC guy went down there and took a picture of it, and it's rusted and all this. But he also showed me organic matter on my HVAC. Two words you don't want to hear with regard to your air conditioning. Um, looked like mold to me. But it was literally locking things up. It had crusted on. It was closing down the vents so that air couldn't flow through. I think of this like muscles on the bottom of a boat. Any of you had, ever had a boat or been out on a boat? And if you been out on one, you'll see like mussels and other mollusks and stuff that will cling to the bottom of a boat. And it makes it, you know, rigid. <clears throat> At first, it just adds drag. It slows you down. You're less clear. You're less able to sm flow through life smoothly. Then it starts to get into the steering, and it starts jamming it up. I read this off, actually off of a site, worried about muscles on your boat. So interesting sites that you, you can visit these days. So yeah, so the next thing that happens is it jams up your steering. You ever known anybody who was so rigid in their thoughts that they couldn't shift, they just went dead ahead, even if that meant ramming into whoever was closest to them? Yeah, you all have met me. I mean, I've done it myself, right? Maybe we see it in ourselves sometimes. Finally, it blocks the cooling system in the engine, and the engine just breaks. So where do these mollusks come from? Well, they start with our nature, with our evolution. We all have five senses plus our mental formations. So in essence, six in Buddhism, but we can think of it for five for our purposes. And we have a point of view that arises from those senses. Okay. Imagine you've got five people walking down a path, and one can only see, and one can only hear, one can only smell, one can only touch, and one can only taste. And they're walking down this path, and a bear pops up. What are they going to experience? They start talking to each other, and the one, or, you know, telepathically, since only one can hear. And telepathically, one says, oh, it's this big brown thing. And the other one says, brown, I don't even know what that means, right? It sounds like, the roar, it's loud. Another one says, I don't know from loud, but all I can tell is it's soft and furry. Another one says, it smells awful. It smells like, you know, dung. The last one says, you guys are all wrong. It's salty and a damn good kisser. Come on. Our five senses are all telling us completely different things. So which one is right? Which one is reality? All of them. And also none of them. They're completely different. So evolution has given us these senses. But the brain is in a dark box called your skull. Your brain does not have a window into reality. All it has is senses telling it things, literally just signals, electrical signals firing from neurons. That's all. There's no reality to sight, sound, smell, taste, or touch. 
beyond just simply signals that relate well enough to the world out there that it doesn't get us killed most of the time. So what the brain does is it gets these signals and over millennia, millions of years, brains develop that said, if I hear a bear and I go running towards it, I will die. Therefore, the ones that ran towards it died and did not breed. And so their lineage ended. Those that were more useful, that heard it and ran away, they survived. There's no necessary connection between your senses and reality out there other than they're very useful to get you to breed and not die. And that's all they care about. So my crackpot theory is that this is why we have so much suffering in the world. The Buddhist term here is dukkha, which I love to use because it just sounds right, dukkha, right? So dukkha means things aren't always perfect. Dukkha arises because we want things to be a certain way and then they change, remember? And our brains were evolved to keep us alive and breeding, but not to make us happy. Happy is irrelevant to breeding. And in Buddhism, we have this point of view, and it arises in a way that makes us think that, okay, well, at least we have all of our senses, right? So I am me, and I am a thing, and I am fixed, and I am, you know, I am Roy. But the traditional Buddhist way of breaking this out is actually, no, you are an aggregate. You are a bunch of things coming together in a way that makes you think that you are a whole being. And these are called the khandhas, or you might have heard of them as skandhas. Uh, Khanda is the Pali term, similar to what the language that the Buddha used, skandha is Sanskrit, but there are five of these things. And I wrote them up here in stuff that might as well be Greek, I suppose, unless some of you can read Greek. Um, and they start with you know, form, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness. And we're going to take those backwards and talk about each of these real briefly. So consciousness. What's consciousness? Consciousness is the sense that I exist as a thing. I can look in a mirror and identify, oh, OK, that's why. Right? I have a sense of self of wholeness, of an identity. I am. Well, that consciousness can get accreted. It can get stuff built on it so it becomes rigid. And where does that rigidity come from? It says, I am. I will not change. And then when we do change, for example, I'm getting older. I have aches and pains that I didn't used to have. I get sick sometimes. I don't like it. Dukkha arises because I'm not supposed to have that. We get defensive. Everything's about us. My wife asks, has the dog been fed yet? And what's my response? It could be, oh, as a matter of fact, the dog has not yet been fed. It's here licking me. You know. Um, but instead, sometimes my response is, it's only 11.30. The dog doesn't get fed till 12. Get off my back. Because I take it as a personal assault. She was just asking, has the dog been fed? But it becomes about me rather than about the dog. Formations. What's formation? So it's one step back from that. It is condition things. The Pali term here is sankara, and I think it's good to kind of learn some of these terms over time, and we repeat them over and over again so they start to sink in. Because if you get too locked in on the English translations, they can lead you astray. Because some of these terms really don't have decent English translations. 
So sankara are things that are conditioned. Anything that's dependent on something else. What's conditioned on something else? Well, pretty much every damn thing. I'm conditioned. My parents, if my parents had never met, I wouldn't exist. Therefore, it is a condition for me to exist that my parents met. And probably the same is true for all of you. Also, volitional actions, I decide to do this, is a sankara. Okay. So, how do we get rigid around these things at the level of formations of sankaras? Well, I think things actually exist. I believe that this podium exists. I believe this bell exists as it is. But as we've already talked about, it will fall apart. I believe my body exists, but there isn't a cell in my body that was there before. As the old expression goes, you never step into the same river twice. You can think of it as the cart, or as like my 1989 car that probably does not have an original part on it. At this point, it's all replacement parts. Is it the same car if there isn't a single part in there that was original? Where's this essence? But we get these same cars. We believe things are rigidly true rather than everything simply being a system, a function of time and change as things adapt and shift. There's nothing rigid and eternal. It's that level of formation that wants to convince us otherwise. Okay, we've got consciousness, we've got these sankharas, below that is perception. We perceive that something has a shape, something has a color. This is a bell-shaped bell. What color do you guys want to call that? Espresso. Espresso, I love it. Espresso. Let's try this one black, right? It's black. We know this. Everybody agree this is black? It's got a certain shape. Well, that's got to be right, right? No. Again, remember, your brain is in a black box, and it only has input. Light from this reflects off, hits your cones in your eyes, sets a signal to your brain. The light itself, though, only has wavelength. It has no color, simply wavelength. Some connect with our brain that we can see, and some connect with our brain that we can't see. So, you know, ultraviolet light, microwave radiation, it's all photons, it's all light. It's just light we can't see. And the brain invents the color. The color does not exist. So, some weird stuff here. Some languages do not have a word for the color blue. So if you point at that shirt and you say, what color is it? They'll say green. Because in every language, green comes before blue. And if you show them a wheel of colors and every color is green, except you've got some that are like blue, they won't be able to distinguish the blue from the green. There is a language that has two different words for green. And if you show a wheel with all of the greens in it, we see all of them as the exact same color. And we can't pick out which one is the separate green. But every single person who knows that language will point. That's the one that's the other kind of green. They see colors that you and I cannot see. Color is a construct of our language and our training. We are taught that there is a color blue, but there's only one type of green. There's only one color green. And you can have shades and all that. It's conditioned.
dress gate. Remember? Is it blue and black or white and yellow? This stuff pisses me off. Right? I want to know reality. And so I'm sharing the good news that you don't get to know reality as it is. And I'm sorry. And it's frustrating. And it arise, gives rise to dukkha, to that thing that things aren't perfect. Can we be here with that? Can we accept it? Can we drop the rigidity that I have to know that this is black? Can I drop the rigidity that I have to know what reality is? Not fun. It's the practice. Why? Because it makes us better able to deal with reality as it is. We don't have to fight over whether it's green or blue, whether the dress is white and yellow or black and blue. Right. Not always so. Well, it has to stop there, right? At some point, there has to be reality. Well, the next level down is feeling, or feeling tone, or the term thrown around a lot here is Vedanas, or it's pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Okay, so feelings in this sense is not like angry or sad or any of those others. It's just simply three options. I like it, I don't like it, or I'm neutral. The same three feelings that that plant has. Okay, it's pointed towards the room, but my guess is, and we've got folks who can correct me, that if the light is coming through that window, eventually it will grow towards that light. Because... Light is pleasant. If you put a flame next to it, it will grow away from the flame. Heat is unpleasant. And if everything is the same around it, it will be neutral and it will just do its thing. Those are the Vedanas. And we have those too. Things are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Is this reality? Pain and pleasure. Those you can't argue with, right? Well, except for the people who enjoy pain. People who are afraid of pleasure. I've had many times in my life where the last thing I wanted was for things to go well. <laughs> I managed to screw things up for myself because I didn't trust pleasure. And this practice, if you follow it long enough, you can get to a place where pain and pleasure are just, yeah, pain and pleasure. And I don't have to run from and be avoidant of pain. And I don't have to spend my life chasing after pleasure. I can just be present right here in the middle of both pleasure and pain. Have equanimity in the midst of them both. Even pleasure and pain are not absolute. Which then takes us to the final one, form or rupa. Again, a very critical term. Sometimes we'll talk about nama rupa, but here we're just talking about rupa or the form itself. So I, I think I said before, you know, there is a Roy, most likely. I can't prove otherwise. And if there wasn't one, you wouldn't be listening to me. So there is stuff out there. But just our brains in the middle of our black boxes don't actually experience them directly, but only indirectly. But we know what's real, right? If you ask us, we always know what's real. But no, we don't. We don't know what the color is. We don't know that it actually exists the way we have it. All that there is is just reality in our actions that at the end of the day, help us not get killed and live long enough to breathe. Beyond that, there's a gulf beyond which we can never cross. So I've laid out the challenge to the very root of our being. Can we let go of our fixed mind? Can we let go of our rigidity? Can we strip off all of the crap on our minds and just be clear and present and open in this moment? 
I hope I make it sound enticing. I hope I don't make it sound easy. This is not an easy fix. There's no trick to it. It's not like one of those websites, five easy tricks to make your mind naked. You know. But can we look at the mind as it is right now and rest in naked, ordinary mind? Mind with no mollusks. Mind with no organic matter, just simply naked mind. Here I'm going to go weird on you and pull out some Zen crap because when we get this deep, Zen sometimes makes us, pushes us to a place where we might not naturally go. And the Zen guy of all Zen guys is a guy named Dogen. And he said this, the mind that has been authentically transmitted is one mind in all dharmas, all dharmas are one mind. For this recent reason, an ancient said, when we understand the mind, there is not an inch of soil on the great earth. We should know that when we understand the mind, the entire sky is struck down and the whole earth is ripped apart. I don't have a time to try and decipher all of that, but let me just say that this exercise is one that strips away every bit of earth there, till there's not even a grain of dirt left. It breaks open the entire sky. It is a radical shift and movement away from the reality that we normally expect. It's releasing that point of view that says, okay, I see everything from my perspective. Evolution gives it to us. I'll never see it from yours. And therefore, my perception is correct and right. Can we make literally that leap into seeing reality from another viewpoint of breaking apart all points of view and just simply being present to the entire universe as it is now? Yeah. Yes. The mind that has been authentically transmitted is one mind is all dharmas, or one mind is all things. One mind is every chair, sealing all items in the universe. All things in the universe are one mind. For this reason, an ancient said, when we understand the mind, there is not an inch of soil on the great earth. We should know that when we understand the mind, the entire sky is struck down and the whole earth is ripped apart. So this practice is one that from the Theravada tradition that we practice here is every day practicing making the mind a little more naked, stripping off a little bit of these accretions. And one place where this practice is really broken down to its essence is called the Anapanasati Sutta, or a sutta of mindfulness of breath. It's all about breath. And it has various practices in uh, you can see Anapanasati up there if you can actually read that writing. And what it does is for each of these skandhas, it gives us a practice to make it a little bit more naked. So for consciousness, well, let's start with, with form. We have this body. We follow the breath in, out, like we did earlier. Following this breath in and out, we let go of anything other than breath. So breath just becomes breath. Not my breath, not your breath, not breath in the chest, not breath in the, in the nose. Simply breath and nothing but breath. Naked breath. Until we feel the nature of that breath shift and become something completely different and completely just itself. We have feelings, that Vedanas, pleasant, unpleasant. In the terms of the Anapanasati, our whole body becomes part of our awareness, and then that whole body drops away. 
so that we note the lack of our body. Perceptions, we get emotions, we get beliefs about formations. Anapati, Anapanasati says the next stage of this is rapture, joy, but not based on pleasant, not based on not having unpleasant, but just the rapture of being in the moment, completely in the moment. Who knew that part of having the naked mind of losing rigidity was actually joy, rapture, happiness? It's a key element to this practice. And when I find that I'm experiencing true joy, it's not about me anymore. It's not about separation. It's not about being better than somebody. It's just being caught up in rapture. And all else falls away. That rapture is a type of naked mind. Then we contemplate for formations, the mind itself, mental formations. We note the mind going where it goes. We allow it to be what it is without judgment of what it should be. And then finally, we let go of the concept of I altogether. So we're resting in the immediate present without trying to be anything else or anywhere else. So let me wrap this up a bit with another quote from Dogen because why not? If we're going to be naked. We might as well be have a naked mind to all of the you know complexity and weirdness of, of a Zen thought. And this is the most famous quote. To study the way, or the Buddha way, to study all of this, is to study the self. We start with studying ourself. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by myriad things, by the dharmas, by everything. Okay. So I'm going to go through this, and I'll go back through it in a second. When we are actualized, when we are made actual by every myriad thing, your body and mind, as well as the bodies and minds of others, drop away. No trace of enlightenment remains. And this no trace continues endlessly. When you ride in a boat and watch the shore, you might assume that the shore is moving. But when you keep your eyes closely on the boat, you can see that the boat moves. Similarly, if you examine many things with a confused mind, you might suppose that your mind and nature are permanent. But when you practice intimately and return to where you are, it will be clear that there is nothing that has unchanging self. When both body and mind are at peace, all things appear as they are, perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Okay, let's run through that one more time. So to be here when we're here, we're studying ourselves, right? Anybody here to be here for somebody else? Anybody ever pee for somebody else? You can't do this for somebody else. You can only do this for yourself. So we've got to acknowledge that to start. But when we're coming here and we're doing it for ourselves, we're actually forgetting ourselves. We're getting into that state of rapture where it's not about me anymore. Because we can't learn about ourselves until we forget ourselves. That's sort of the weird backward step that doesn't really make sense, except it totally makes sense when you do it. So we forget ourselves, and that's when we can become more aware of the things that give rise to this thing we call self. So we're no longer about me. We're about everything else, all the dharmas, all the myriad things, the chair, the clock, the person sitting next to you. And those we see are part of our reality. So I am 
causes and conditions. My parents created me, my job created me, my school created me, my friends create me. I am part of a bigger system. And without that system, I make no sense. And that system makes no sense without me. Right? Just like the thermostat is part of the HVAC system. And without the thermostat, the HVAC system doesn't work. We're part of a system, and everything in the entire universe is within this system. So the universe does not exist without us, and we don't exist without the universe. So we become because we are part of the universe, and the universe makes us. And when we see this, our body and minds drop away. The rigidity drops away. Our mind becomes naked. And part of dropping away that nakedness is, as he says, no trace of enlightenment remains. If you're here to be enlightened, that's fine. Wouldn't we all like to be enlightened? The problem is that enlightenment is something that we grasp to. It becomes a rigid thing. It becomes a concept. And when we actually experience enlightenment, enlightenment itself drops away. There's no concept of it anymore. It's just present in the rapture of this moment. Does this make sense? And that rapture of being present in this moment continues endlessly. So the enlightenment that doesn't exist continues forever. And then he gives this very great analogy of riding in a boat. So the same thing on a train. You're riding on a train and it, you look like, it looks to you like the world is going by and you're stationary. You feel stationary. You can play catch on a train, right? You throw the ball, it goes, it comes back, right? So it feels like you are sitting still and the world is flying by you. But if you look closely, you can see no. You know, it's bumping. There's, you know, I can look down at the train tracks. If I'm riding in a boat, I can see the shore moving, and it looks like the shore is moving, but actually I can see the boat going through the water. The same when we meditate or when we go through our daily life. If I really look carefully at what's going on, I think life is happening to me. I think I am permanent. I think I am fixed. I am like the person on the train that isn't moving. But actually, I am constantly changing. I am constantly moving. There is no fixed Roy that isn't changing moment to moment. And meditation is the very practical experience of watching ourselves change moment by moment. And he says, when both body and mind are at peace, all things appear as they are. Perfect, complete, lacking nothing. What's up, y'all? Reverend Mikey Noshal here from Wild Heart Meditation Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks for checking us out. Do me a favor, please like and subscribe. And if you feel moved to leave a donation, you can do so at wildheartmeditationcenter.org or the Venmo link in the description. Peace and love.